be poor. Be poor. That's what we're going to talk about today. A topic that I guarantee you, you will not hear in today's church. But nevertheless, it is a commandment. Not a commandment. It is an admonishment. It is a quality of the citizens of the kingdom. We're going to look at that today in some various places in the Bible. In one such place in the gospel, according to Luke chapter 16, we're given a story about a rich man and Lazarus. A rich man don't have no name given to him. But Lazarus, we learn his name. Many a Christian, non-Christian alike, have read, heard, heard about this story. And we're going to read it here shortly in case you don't remember, never heard it before. And those who have heard of the story usually conclude that the crux of the story has to do with not being like the rich man. See, the rich man had this opportunity in front of his eyes every day to do good. And instead, he focused on himself. Don't be selfish. That's the that's the moral that people generally take away from the story. Then this worldly carnal Christianity tries to doctor up the story to fit with their rich man theology because they secretly want to be the rich man. They secretly preach that you should be the rich man. It's okay to have riches. It's okay to dress nice. When you look good, you feel good. Just don't be like the rich man was. That's how they, they spin it so that it's still a good moral. Don't be selfish. Don't, don't be stepping over and sometimes on the poor, the more misfortunate in order to move ahead in life. That's, that's the way it gets twisted. We're going to visit down that road today and hopefully we're going to see how much of a lie that is. That rich man theology that has crept into the faith. This, this idea that being rich is a godly, a godly ideal. We're going to go to the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 16. Gospel according to Luke. Understanding that there is a difference between earthly wealth and spiritual wealth. And just as much as the carnal wisdom of this world is foolishness when you place it up next to the spiritual wisdom that comes from God. This carnal wealth is nothing to be esteemed when put next to the real, actual, true wealth, the spiritual wealth that we ought to be accumulating in, in our obedience and our submission to the similitude of Christ. Luke chapter 16, I'm going to start reading that verse 19. There was a certain rich man, that's the rich man, which was clothed in purple as a symbol of royalty high status and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. It means he ate good and everything that he did was good. It was just wonderful. Everything that he did was just extravagant. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores. Somebody purposely put him there. And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell, he lift up his eyes being in torments and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, son, Remember that thou in thy lifetime received thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And besides all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, 
so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot. Neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. And Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. Are you sure? Because Jesus rose from the dead, and I don't see too much repentance in this world. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. That's a deep statement that right there, because if you really break it down, Moses and the prophets is embodied in the one who rose from the dead because in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. We're not going to go down that route. There's a lot of deep stuff that we can unpack. There's there's an image and a, and a picture of the spiritual realm that would help us just understand how that dimension works and how how strange it is compared to, to our dimension. How can you have a great distance between that you can't even cross yet? You can simply speak and the person way far away can hear you. How can this one person be holding someone so far away that you could never get there if you traveled? Yet you can see clearly and identify the two people who is all of these mysteries. We can we can unpack those. But those those that's for maybe a, a different time and a different season. Today, I'm going to admonish you to be poor. Again, the crux of this story is usually reduced to don't act like the rich man acted or you go to hell. It's okay to have what the rich man had, which is a deceitful statement all by itself. We're going we're gonna to look at the exact verse that says that. But I ain't heard no one preach on an equally important point. Be Lazarus. Be poor. Because that, that don't preach well. But that's the lifestyle that is supported by the word of God. We'll see that in a moment and what that truly means. But before we do that, can anyone quote for me some verses from this book that admonishes one to amass physical wealth? That, that, that there's a, a spiritual blessing in the status of richness, that, that the things you have and enjoy in this life are proportional to how close you are to God. Any scriptures? One. Rather, the Bible says, labor not to be rich. Cease from thine own wisdom. Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let, let not the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. Jesus himself says the deceitfulness of riches. That's that word again that I said we talk about. Deceitfulness of riches will choke the word. The Bible says worldly riches are a woeful burden to be carefully and completely exhausted for God's kingdom. I'm going to say that again because that's an important key for today. The holistic viewpoint of the Bible and worldly riches is that they are a woeful burden. Woe to you that are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woeful burden to be carefully and completely exhausted for God's kingdom. If you die and there's resources in your hand that are not specifically assigned to your seed or your inheritance, then you have died without fulfilling some purpose that you could have for the kingdom. Contrary to popular belief, the Bible says that it's the poor that get to hear the good news, the gospel. The Bible says it's the poor that get embraced by Abraham in heaven. The Bible says it's the poor who are the citizens of the kingdom of heaven. So, so today I want to say something that I, again, am 110% certain you will never hear in the world's church. Be Lazarus. Be poor. Not 
aimlessly, carelessly, well, since I can't have nothing good here, then here, then I just throw it all away and set your money on fire and just throw it to some random organization. Because though you bestow all your goods to the poor, if you do not do it as a result of tabernacling with God and a desire to walk more closely in his image, the Bible says you are nothing. not necessarily on purpose become physically destitute and on purpose live in poverty. Poverty in and of itself is not the blessing. Lack is not a quality of the kingdom and lack and being poor isn't necessarily the same thing. Lack is not a quality of the kingdom you're looking for when you learn to be poor. As it's written, when the disciples were sent out in what we define today as poverty, Their own testimony was that they lacked nothing. You can read that account in Luke chapter 22, around verse 30, 35. Even though by our estimation, they they, they were sent out without scrip, no no food, no money, no extra pair of shoes, even though the journey was long, you got to walk from city to city, no extra coat in case it gets cold, no nothing extra. Just the clothes you got on your back and the stuff you got in your hand. They were sent out by the word like that. And the Bible says their own testimony from their own mouth was that they lacked nothing. Lack is not a quality of the kingdom. Rather, our God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. The the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. The gold is mine and the silver is mine, says the Lord. No, we become poor to assume the beggarly spiritual state of always asking, always needing, always longing for the presence of the Lord and his words to give life to our situations. Yes, he has the cattle on a thousand hills, but what do you want, the cattle or him? Yes, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The gold is his, the silver, the trees of Lebanon are not sufficient to make an altar and burn. Every cattle, every cow, cricket, goat, snail, everything on earth set on fire still isn't enough for a burnt offering that would be worthy in his presence. But what do you want, the stuff in the world or do you want him? You want the good experience, the good life, the good this, the good that, or him? Do you want the extravagancies, whatever the extravagancies mean to you, whether it's simple and elegant or whether it's exquisite and everything's gold-plated? What do you want in this life? The stuff that you think you want or do you simply want him, whatever that is? And woe to you if you get any of those things and you truly don't have a greater posture of begging for him than any of those things or their maintenance. Because as I said before in a previous sermon, you will become a whore for the things that you want and prostitute yourself out, making yourself useless in a vessel of dishonor in the hand of the God you say you serve. For what profiteth a man to gain the whole world, everything, and lose his So, the Most High is the only one who can keep or kill that most valuable real estate. Recently, I was speaking with a man. Man had a lot of stuff, a lot of wealth. Over 500 acres here, 100 and some odd acres there, and I got properties in seven different countries, and I teach all over the world because I'm so wise, and people look up to me for all I've accomplished and done in life. And, and remember one thing, young man, that's what he called me, said young man. Remember, young man, your health is your wealth. That's what he said. And to that, I agree. I agreed with him while I talked with him. But I was speaking of the spiritual health. He was speaking of the physical Which one does your life show that you value more? That's your homework for this week. Take an account of your life, the actions and the activities that you participate in and the reason that you do the things you do and say, is the life that I'm living here more important to me? Are the things that I experience here more important to me? Or is my life there more important to me? Is my spiritual health more important to me? That's your homework. 
spiritual health or physical health? What's more important to you? What does your life evidence? Not what you answer with your conscious mind, but look, take an inventory. Bible says examine yourself to see whether or not you be in the faith. Look over your life and see the actions, the choices. I got to take care of my family. I got to pay these bills. I got to do this, that, and the other. The, the, why? What's more important to you? But you don't have to own property in seven different countries and have over a thousand acres of land and whatnot to be considered rich. If you live right here in the good old U.S. of A., whether you're homeless or you're a neurosurgeon, you are richer than 60% of the world right now. Right now. With access to clean drinking water at just about any store that you walk into. You, yeah, you might have to be embarrassed by sitting out in front of a homeless shelter, a Salvation Army, or a church building, but you can eat something that won't kill you immediately every day if you wanted to. Three good meals and not pay nothing for it. Wealthy. Wealthy, wealthy nation. That, that may not be for too much longer, but for today, I need us to see that unless your spiritual posture before the Most High is one of repentance and earnest begging for more of his presence, not just, Lord, I want more of you, begging. We're going to talk about what that, what that translates to in just a minute. Begging for more of his presence in your life. If there's anything in this world that will cause you to turn from him unto it. I got to take care of my family. I got to take care of this. I got to do that. I got to handle this over here. And then I'll go back to picking up the mantle he put on my life. Then you are that rich man. I need you to see that today. If there's anything in this world, regardless of how you exegete the scripture, regardless of what you think, the Bible says if there's anything in the world, the Bible says he who loves father, son, mother, daughter more than me is not worthy of me, any man, anything in this world that will cause you to turn from him unto that thing, unto that state, unto that group, unto whatever, you are that rich man. And you are in danger of going to the same place that he went to. And I don't care what your pastor says. I don't care what your daily devotional from that Christian store says. I don't care what the Shufa chief prophetess with the anointing on high said and she just prophesied on you got olive oil still on your head. I don't care what they said. If the word says any man, any man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is not fit for the kingdom of God. If you love brother, sister, wife, house, land more than him, you are not worthy of him. The Bible says deny yourself. Your wants, your desires, your how you think it should be. Your this is what it means to me. Your logical conclusions is look, I got my honorary doctorate from Hooligan State University. Deny that any conclusion you make that's not supported by this scripture is right. No matter how much you want it to be. And assume a life that's only supported by obedience to this word. Regardless of what you have to give up. And joyfully maintain that state until you can honorably be used in the liberty that only comes with being properly matured in the word and made in the image of Christ. Know that to be true, though it's just too deep for this service in this time right now. There's scripture that backs up that whole statement. That's the posture of the returned and the restored exile or captive. We, we won't, again, we won't go into that. But in Ezra chapter 9, men walked away from their families, their children, saying, this is what the word of God says. This is what we're going to do. Even though when God disowned them from being his people, he told them, go ahead, do what you want to do. Marry sons and daughters and wives. And make sure that your, your increase did not diminish in the land and, and seek the peace of the land and, and just, you know, go along to get along, do whatever you got to do. I'll come see you in 70 years. After you get so sick of being around this vanity, this pagan mindset, this emptiness all around you and look how pretty my gold plated whatever thing is and I got the new such and so and just so empty after you get sick of that 
and you and you're so desperate for me that you'll walk away from your family, I'll come see you then. For today, I just need us to learn how to be Lazarus. Be poor. Be poor. Why is that, Pastor? I'm glad you asked. Turn to Matthew with me. Chapter 5. We're going to look at a very, very key scripture today. Hopefully see why being poor in such a way is so vital to the life of the believer. Matthew chapter 5, we're just going to read one verse. Verse 3, this is part of the Beatitudes. It's the first Beatitude. It says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven we've talked about how spirit manifests into the physical so I'm not going to argue with those people well that says poor in spirit it don't say poor in the physical that which is in the spiritual comes into the physical realm that things that are made are not made by things which do appear we can go down that whole scriptural sword fight all you want to but the Bible's clearly states that the things that we experience in this realm, this physical realm come from a spiritual place Christ is not saying be blessed, be poor in your spirit and be rich in the physical, he's saying be poor from the place where it matters be a beggar from the place where it matters that's what that word means poor beggarly not just not just in poverty, but having a a conscious, being conscious that you are lacking resources and consistently petitioning to the one able to change that situation. That's the importance of that word. One who lacks resources, knowledgeable of it, and is consistently petitioning the one able to change their situation to do so. I'm say that again for, for us writing. The, the importance of being poor, again, is not lacking, but it's having that lack, having that need that you cannot yourself fulfill, being knowledgeable of that need and consistently petitioning the one who is able to change that situation, to change that situation. Every chance they get, every opportunity they come to, whatever they say do, you'll do it. If it'll change your situation, you don't care that that it's going to mean that I have to walk away from this place or I can't do that no more. You know, when a homeless person really don't want to be homeless no more, they'll do whatever they have to do to not be homeless no more. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that their situation is going to change because we are men living in a broken world and we are not God. But they'll do whatever they got to do. Whatever the, the, the program says, they'll do it. You want another good real world example of this, this spiritual posture and action, but tied, tied to the wrong altar? Fat people. Not all fat people, but many fat people. They'll see an ad on TV uh, take this pill to be some sad fat person and they'll be sitting in their room and they'll be sad and they'll be at the gym and they'll still be sad and then they'll take a pill and then it says three months later and they're skinny and they're riding a bicycle through a field and then you'll hear that this may cause death anal bleeding and everything else that might happen and they'll got to get that pill they'll see an ad on tv of some guy holding the crazy looking contraption and he's fit and toned and and you'll lose weight and just buy this butt reducer 10,000 or whatever you think that they got to I'll buy it they'll go to every gym they'll go to every sauna they'll buy the little trash bag suit and walk up and down their street until they can't walk no more they'll do anything that they can and still ain't lose the weight and then they come around your mountain this is the story that you hear I tried everything 
Not to get sidetracked, but the reason that they don't lose the weight is because they have the wrong motivation and they're listening to the wrong word. But is that your spiritual state before the Most High? I'll try anything. Whatever you say, whatever he say, do, you'll do it. Whatever word comes down your alley to to do that thing, to get into a closer relationship, you'll do it even without regard for your own life. You'll do it. Or will you do some things and eventually walk away sad like the rich young ruler, like we talked about last week, because you wouldn't give up the one thing that secretly and truly was your everything. That type of spirit, that rich young ruler spirit will cause you to hear the voice of God that says, arise, take all your household and flee into Egypt. And then roll over (laughs) because you love your rest more than you love obedience. Now your son and the only hope of the future is dead. That rich young ruler spirit will cause you to see the face of your assignment every day and step over it so that your fine linen don't get soiled up and dirty and so that your sumptuous meal don't go cold. And you'll never realize that dirty, smelly eyesore that's bringing down my property value is the closest you'll ever get to heaven. Brothers and sisters, be Lazarus. Be poor. Be so hungry for the word of God that you will face the humility of being seen by everybody driving by, camping out in front of the homeless shelter, the Salvation Army, the Red Cross, wherever it is, just so that you can get that next meal of the word. Whatever you got to do to get to him, you'll do it. To get that bread of life quickly, speedily, without any regard for what it's going to cost you. I got to get to that place. I'll give up everything, knowing that even if the action was wrong and your intention was right, that he who sees the heart in such a poor, hungry spirit postured before him, so desperate that they even gave up the thing that he didn't require. That he who is faithful will mold and mature you until your action matches your intention. That's that's the promise that he gave you, that he who began a good work in you shall complete it even into the day of Jesus Christ. But, but there's, some, there's some good conditions to that. You got to lay aside every weight. That's what the Bible says. Lay aside every weight. We've talked about that every weight. We talked about exactly what that means before. It. Be Lazarus. Be poor. You ever seen anybody actually starving before? Not like the American I uh, ate, you know, three course, five course, 12 course meal at breakfast and I chewed a candy bar shortly afterwards, but it's three, three in the afternoon now and, and I'm starving. Not, not that. That's not starving. That's, uh, that's another word that we're not going to get into today. That's not starving. I'm talking about belly distended, face sunken in, ain't ate in two, three weeks just barely hanging on, can't even hardly move except for to hold out the hand to, to get help from somebody, anybody. Starving so bad that even if you gave them food, their body system isn't strong enough to process it. About to die soon, starving. You ever seen anybody like that? You ever met anybody like that? If you ever do get a chance to do that, those people will eat dirt. They'll eat worms. They'll eat bugs. They'll eat dead animals that they find. They'll eat each other if they get a chance, if they have the ability to. The Bible says those people, starving to death people, they'll eat their own children. They will. Are you so hungry? So, so desperate for the spirit of the living God that you'll do those unsavory things, those, those things that you don't want to do, those nasty, that doesn't look right. I don't, why would you put that in front of me to do that? Lord, I don't think that, why would you ask me to do this? Marinate on that. As I remind you that the rich young ruler did the things of God that he was okay with doing. He honored his mother and father. 
He didn't steal. He didn't murder. He didn't lie. He's done them things since he was a youth up. Those were tolerable. Those were nice tuna sandwiches, ham sandwiches, chicken sandwiches, whatever sandwich that you like to eat is nice. But when God put that plate of worms in front of him, and God put the dirt in front of his plate. And God put that nasty. Why would you? I don't eat chitlins. That's nasty. Whatever thing that people eat that you don't like to eat because you think it's nasty because ill. Why would you put that on my plate, Lord? You know, I don't. When he does that. Are you so hungry for him that that's the only thing that's before me right now? So. Because the Bible says that those are the citizens of heaven, the people that it don't matter what I like. It don't matter how I feel. It don't matter what I think. His word says this, and I saw it clearly. I read it clearly. I heard it clearly. His word said this. I'm going to do it. Even though I love my son. Even though we just had the most profitable business day of our year. Even though I don't want to die, Lord. I'll get on the cross. If it's your will, I'll do it. If it's your word. Those are the citizens of heaven. Be Lazarus in the spirit. And let that fruit manifest as your evidence here. Evidence for you. That you might be certain. Sure and without doubt. That you are anchored by a rock unmovable. Be poor in the spirit. And show forth the signs and wonders of God in this realm. Instead of your new Maserati. Or photos from your last vacation. Be Lazarus. Be be poor. Maybe you're listening to this message and you're realizing that I've been listening to the world's church and they've been telling me to live my best life now and to, to live the good life and that God wants me to be happy and God wants me to be rich and God wants me to be wealthy and God wants me to smile all the time and, and, and they never read Lamentations. They never read Jeremiah to me. They they never read Isaiah to me. They they never read all the other parts of the Bible that says there's a time and a season for all things. A time to laugh and a time to cry. If you laugh when God says cry, you're in just as much disobedience if you cry when he says laugh. And you're realizing that as much as you don't want to admit it, I've been in disobedience. I've been wrong and I don't want to stay wrong. I want to get right with the Lord so much that I'll give it all up if he asks me to. I'll do whatever he wants me to do because I I want his word to be active and living in my life that much. And I want you to come now. I want you to reach out now. I want you to stand right where you are in the testimony of everyone who can see and hear you and let it be known that you renounce everything of this world. Friends, family, wealth, self, everything. If it means that you can get closer to him. Father God, we thank you. We thank you that you give us the opportunity to be poor. Only so that we can see how truly rich you are. That we don't have to have it in our bank accounts. We don't have to have it on our backs. We don't have to have it in our hand. That if we only listen to what you have said. That we will truly realize that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. That that you who rained down manna on our forefathers are the same one who is able to bring us into a living and true state with you closer and closer. Bring us into a prosperity, though we have no place to lay our head. Though the foxes have holes, though the the birds have nests, though we're moving from city to city, though we're doing all of these things that people would say, that's a vagabond's life. But yet there's no lack in our camp. There's, There's abundance in every step that we take. 
Every location that we walk into is prepared. As if an angel has gone forth before us. That your hedge that covers and keeps us, God, is more potent than a bank account. That your word, O Most High, is more powerful than any medicine that man could fabricate. Help us be so desperate for your presence, for your word, to be properly postured before you that we would receive of that which you have said that we might move into the next place of our building, that we are willing to forsake all and follow you. Help us to be poor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.